Welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. In Japan it's called the Gone Shock. It is the stunning arrest of Carlos Ghosn, the jet-setting CEO who saved Nissan and made it part of a global automotive empire. Even more shocking was his daring escape from Japan, packed into a box and put on a private jet to Lebanon after months spent in a Japanese detention center, subsisting on rice gruel. This is the saga of what led to the Gone shock and what was left in its wake. Gone spent two decades building a colossal partnership between Nissan and Renault that looked like a new model for a global business, but the alliance's shiny image fronted an unsteady, tense operation. Culture clashes, infighting among executives and engineers, dueling corporate traditions, and government maneuvering constantly threatened the venture. Journalists Hans Grimmel and William Sposato have followed the story up close, with access to key players, including Gone himself. Veteran Tokyo-based reporters, they have witnessed the end of Japan's bubble economy and attempts at opening Japan incorporated to the world. They've seen the fraying of Kiretsu, Japan's traditional skein of business relationships, and covered numerous corporate scandals, of which the Gone Shock and Gone's subsequent escape stand above all. Expertly reported, Collision Course explores the complex suspicions around what and who is really responsible for Gone's ouster and why one of the top executives in the world would risk everything to escape the country. It explains how economics, history, national interests, cultural politics, and hubris collided, crumpling the legacy of arguably the most important foreign businessman ever to set foot in Japan. And now, please welcome Hans Grimmel and William Sposato. Hans will start by discussing his view of the saga, followed by William. Let me take you back in time a little bit. I'll tell a little bit about how I came into the story. You know, there's always these moments in time where you always remember where you were, where you hear the first word of a, some kind of a news event. And it might be like the Kennedy assassination for some, or perhaps the space shuttle Challenger exploding, or maybe the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Centers, or even the earthquake here, the 2011 earthquake in Japan. But for me personally, there's another mega event that's kind of burned into my brain, and that is the stunning arrest of Carlos Ghosn who at the time was the chairman of the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi Auto Alliance, and he was one of the most storied auto executives in the history of the industry. So I'll always remember where I was when I heard that news the first time. I teach journalism school at Washington Graduate School of Journalism as a part-time night school, and it's just for beer money. I was teaching right before 6 o'clock on Monday, November 19th, 2018. And just before class starts, I just out of habit checked my phone for my email and I see a, a message there from my assistant. It says the, the subject line reading, gone. So I open it and I'm stunned, absolutely floored to see this message that says, it's a news bulletin saying that Carlos Ghosn is about to be arrested and for financial misconduct charges. I thought to myself, if there's ever such a thing as fake news, then this has surely got to be fake news. Or at least there has to be some kind of a reporter's mistake here, or maybe some kind of translation error or something. But I made a few phone calls, and sure enough, fact was stranger than fiction. Nissan would be holding a press conference that night at its world headquarters down in Yokohama at 10 p.m. to explain the whole thing. So even my Waseda students understood who or knew who Carlos Ghosn was and understood the magnitude of this. So they forgave me when I abruptly canceled class and ran off to the train for Yokohama. Nissan headquarters that night was an absolute zoo. The line of reporters waiting to get inside was like going through the lobby and out the front door. And there were literally hundreds of us packed into the eighth floor briefing room where it was standing room only. And that's when then CEO Hiroto Saikawa, the longtime right-hand man of Carlos Ghosn himself, came out and blasted his former mentor as the quote, mastermind of years of financial misconduct during his time at the helm of Nissan. And thus began this three-year odyssey of following what is now known as the Gone Shock. And it's a stunning rise and fall story that of epic proportions. And even today, I still can't believe that it actually happened, that Carlos Ghosn was arrested. It's just that impossible for me to believe if I hadn't actually lived it myself. The upheaval all but wiped out the reputation and the legacy of one of the world's most famous automotive executives. It sent the stock prices of Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi tumbling 60% within the first year. It nearly shattered the automotive empire that Carlos Ghosn spent two decades building into the world's largest automotive group. And it cast a uh, embarrassing spotlight 
on Japan's justice system and Japan's corporate governance program on the global stage. And it ultimately resulted in our book, Collision Course, which we're delighted to be here to talk to you all about today. The scandal continues to rock the industry and it remains the subject of hot speculation and debate, even to this day, almost three years to the date of this month after the initial arrests. And the question is, was Carlos Ghosn simply a corporate crook who overstayed his welcome, grew complacent, and crossed the line by basically treating the company as his personal piggy bank? Or was he the victim of a corporate coup by entrenched Japanese interests who framed this famed executive to prevent him from integrating Nissan into its French partner, Renault? In other words, was Ghosn a sacrifice? Was he the sacrificial lamb to keep Nissan as a Japanese company? I spoke with Carlos Ghosn just about three weeks ago, last month. And uh, just for your information, he assures me that he is not a crook. As you know, he's living as an international fugitive, sheltering in Beirut, Lebanon. And he's living in that pink walled townhouse that you see often shown in the media. And uh, that's one of the houses that Nissan originally bought for him to live in as one of his global residences. It includes places here in Tokyo, in Paris, and in Amsterdam, and also in Rio de Janeiro. Anyhow, now they're arguing about who actually owns it. Gone has this video and he has this airy study with bookshelves behind him, packed with like photos and knickknacks and other little mementos of his life as a superstar executive who kind of globe trotted around the world and hobnobbed with business tycoons and heads of state and royalty. His library even has one of those the ladders on a rail that slides back and forth so that you can reach the high books like you have in like an old time library or a fancy bookstore. In talking with him, I would describe his current state of mind uh, with maybe three words, and that would be defiant, unrepentant, and aggrieved. So the number one priority for him at this stage is rebuilding his reputation. He admits that it will be an uphill battle, of course, but uh, he's writing books, he's participating in documentaries, he's uh, doing lots of interviews, he's teaching management courses and seminars at local universities in Lebanon, and he's even consulting for startups these days. So he clearly wants to present himself or reposition himself as somebody who's still relevant to the international business community and the automotive industry in particular. As he told me, quote, I'm still in the game. He even imagines himself as the director of a company board someday. That might be a taller order for him because under this U.S. settlement with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission that he signed in 2019, Gone is barred from serving as a director of a U.S. publicly traded company for 10 years. And of course, the other thing that Carlos Ghosn loves to do these days is continue to bash on Nissan and the alliance with Renault. In public interviews, of course, he never fails to mention Nissan as, quote, this boring company nobody cares about, or dismiss the alliance as, quote, a zombie. So he says the alliance with Renault is bound to break apart without a strong leader like him at the helm to give it leadership. So Ghosn seems to harbor not even the slightest doubt of his innocence. You know, he has zero regrets about jumping bail and fleeing Japan. He forfeited $14 million in bail just to get out of here. And that was reportedly a record bail for Japan. But to him, it was worth it because escaping Japan was the only way that he felt he could tell his side of the story. In Japan, he says, he would have faced certain prison in what he says is the biased justice system here. As Gohan himself said when he landed in Beirut and stunned the world, he first word to the public after landing there, he said, quote, I have not fled justice. I have escaped injustice and political persecution. I can now finally communicate freely with the media. And that's exactly what he did just days after landing in Lebanon. On January 8, 2020, he invited the world's media to Beirut for the first press conference since his arrest. And so I was there and Gone, this great communicator, was totally in his element. He held court in a packed press briefing room for two and a half hours. He was walking the floor. He was fielding questions in French, in Portuguese, and in Arabic, and in English. And he was cracking jokes. And of course, he the whole time he was railing against Nissan and the Japanese justice system the whole time. In my recent discussions with Gohn, he opened up about one of the biggest mysteries about the case, which is how did he manage to escape Japan? And as we now know, on December 29th, 2019, as Japan was getting ready for the New Year holiday, 
Carlos Ghosn sneaked out of his court-monitored home here in Tokyo. It's just right around the corner, actually, from the Tokyo American Club, if any of you know that, near Rapungi. And he walked over to the Rapungi Grand Hyatt Hotel, and he met up with a team of operatives there. And leading this team was a former American Green Beret. They went to Shinagawa Station, which is literally right out the door here, where we're meeting tonight. And they dashed across the country on the Shinkansen bullet train to Osaka, the other, the second biggest city here in Japan. And there they checked into another hotel, and that's where they packed Doan into this oversized musical equipment case. And then the most nerve-wracking moment of the escape, according to Doan, was when the airport staff at Kansai International Airport was debating whether or not to x-ray that trunk that he was hiding in. Gone was scrunched up inside the trunk, and he could hear the officials deliberating outside what to do. But he couldn't tell which way the decision would go because they were speaking in Japanese. If they had scanned that trunk, he would be sunk. Gone took a deep breath. He focused and concentrated. The talking stopped, and then the trunk kept moving. And only then did he realize that he had finally made it. Gone and his trunk were loaded onto a private plane and he was spirited out of the country shortly before midnight that day. And in Gone's own words, as he told me, he said, quote, this is the single most important decision that it had an impact on my life. So watch for this moment to be recreated as the climax scene of any kind of Netflix documentary that might be coming out. Regardless of what you think about Gone or the allegations against him, I have to give him credit for just having the courage to even attempt such a brazen escape. It must have been really, it took real nerves of steel, I think, to do it. Getting back to the conspiracy, the crook or conspiracy, in one sense, we can say, yes, there definitely was a conspiracy to get rid of Carlos Gone. A group of three executives at Nissan, the head of internal audit, the head of the legal department, and the head of global government relations admitted in court to launching a secret internal investigation of Gone in early 2018. They even met together for private lunches to discuss the matter, and they took the matter straight to prosecutors, bypassing the board. They didn't go to the board, they took it straight to the prosecutors. And on top of it, they also indicated that yes, indeed, they were against Gone's plan to integrate Nissan into Renault. They wanted to keep Nissan autonomous. But what were the real motives? In court, this group said that the probe was spurred only by their suspicions of financial misconduct, not their differences with Cohn about the corporate integration plan. To them, it was a crime, not a coup. Cohn and his backers, as you can imagine, they say the conspirators wanted to stop the integration with Nissan and Renault the most decisive way they could by taking out the architect of the plan. To believe otherwise, Cohn says, you'd have to be pretty naive. So in this Carlos Ghosn Nissan Motor saga, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. And with Ghosn living in Lebanon beyond the reach of Japanese justice, it's pretty unlikely many, if any of these questions will ever be answered in court of law. So in Collision Course, what we try to do is tell both sides of the story, and we're not afraid to acknowledge that there's lots of gray area and unanswered questions. But there are still lots of important lessons that can still be learned from this case. Right now, the Gon saga is still playing out in courts around the world, thanks to a litany of civil cases, class action suits, and criminal cases. By one count, there are some 50 cases going on around the world. In Japan, the American father and son team that helped Gon escape to Lebanon, they were sentenced to prison here in July. So the father, Michael Taylor, he got two years in prison. And the son, Peter Taylor, he got one year and eight months. And here in Tokyo, the trial is still underway for American Greg Kelly. He's the former Nissan director who was arrested the same day as Gone and charged as his alleged accomplice, essentially, in these financial, in some of these financial charges. The defense made its closing arguments. And now the verdict in Kelly's case is expected in March 2022, more than three years after his arrest. Prosecutors are demanding two years in prison for Kelly. Meanwhile, the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance is anything but certain, the future of it. All three companies now have new CEOs and are struggling to dig out of massive losses. In Nissan's case, it's the biggest loss in the company's history. And relations between the French side and the Japanese side of the alliance are still bruised and battered. 
and critics say the alliance is bound to break up. Now, despite all this upheaval that we've seen over the last three years, the root problem of this unbalanced alliance between Renault and Nissan is still unresolved. Renault is still the smaller company, but owns the controlling 43% stake in Nissan. And Nissan is the bigger company, more profitable company, but it owns only a 15% non-voting stake in Renault. Now, serious discussion on rebalancing that cross-holding relationship were simply kicked into the future, kicked down the road and left unresolved. So that potentially means more fireworks between these companies. Finally, there's the lingering embarrassment about the doubt passed upon Japan's justice system by Gohan's humiliating escape from Japan and all the new attention it brings to what critics here call Japan's hostage justice system. As Gohan himself said upon his arrival in Lebanon, I have not fled justice, I have escaped injustice and political persecution. And to a lot of people, that rings true. Now, finally, there's the million dollar question about what to make of Gohan's legacy today. Carlos Gohan is rightly credited as the man who saved Nissan from near bankruptcy. He introduced many new business concepts to Japan, and he was a pioneer in proselytizing many of the auto industry's trends. That includes one, the company consolidation for massive uh, volumes or huge economies of scale, two, electric vehicles, and three, autonomous driving. He built Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi into the world's largest auto group. In 2017, it sold 10.6 million vehicles in total, accounting for nearly one in eight vehicles sold worldwide that year. But critics say that he took his eye off the road in his later years. He became an emperor with no clothes, and no one could tell him no. Gohan embarked on overambitious expansion plans and began slipping on some of his targets that he was famous for always nailing. For example, his target to sell electric vehicles, he missed that by over 1 million units, 1 million vehicles. He fell short by that much. And today, Gohan's successors at Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi are all downsizing operations. Whereas Gohan said, bigger is better, the new mantra at these companies is small is beautiful. And in the end, of course, despite all his accomplishments and achievements, Gohan's official biography will always be tarnished by this shameful, non-erasable asterisk. And that is that he ended a legendary automotive career being indicted four times and jumping bail to live as an international fugitive. Carlos Ghosn landed in Japan as a legend, but he left Japan in a packing crate. So in that sense, the symbolism speaks for itself. So the Carlos Ghosn Nissan scandal is still riddled with many, many unanswered questions. But with new developments and information always coming to light, we can expect one thing, perhaps, and that is that this uh, sordid saga will continue to evolve, mystify, and be the subject of lots of speculation, probably for years to come. This last chapter of the saga is not yet written, and future generations may view it a lot differently from how we understand it and see it today. And with all the twists and turns that this crazy story has taken so far, I wouldn't rule out anything happening in the future. And that includes the possibility of maybe going ending up back in Japan someday to actually stand trial. So remember, if that actually happens, you heard it here first. And I'll turn it over to William now. He'll flesh out all the details and the nuance, the analysis that I left out. <laughs> Go ahead. That's very kind. Thank you. So this was a very complex case. Obviously, there are cultural issues, corporate culture issues, country cultural issues the role of the French and the Japanese governments, and as Hans mentioned, whether there was indeed, as Gohn contends, a government-led conspiracy to bring him down. So I'll take each of those sort of one at a time. In the corporate culture area, Gohn came in 1999, and one of the amazing things about a foreign executive coming in was he did really well. He seemed to have a sixth sense of what things he needed to change, what Japanese traditional things he should abandon, and which ones he should keep. The need to confer, to get buy-in from colleagues, etc. He seemed to have a handle on that. And indeed, for the first years, it went very, very well. So when you look at the probably the key metric, the value of Nissan from 1999 to 2007, which is when it peaked in value, the market capitalization rose more than 800%. 
or around $60 billion. So Ghosn can claim that he brought $60 billion in value. Whatever the numbers may be at the other side about whether he was underpaid and whether he deserved more sort of pales in comparison to that number. One of the questions that comes up, okay, Nissan is worth around $30 billion today. Tesla is worth a trillion dollars. Does that make sense? That's obviously a question that the tech world will be looking at closely to see if that's going to work out or not. But back to Nissan, everything's going fine. But when we think about general management practice, 19 years is a long time. And two things seem to have happened over the time. Gone on his side, got more and more concerned about what he thought was his lack of proper reward. He was making a lot less money than other people. At one point, his salary before it was cut in half was around $25 million, which is a fairly good salary. But it's not near the top for the size of Nissan. Leslie Moonves at CBS, which is a smaller company, made $70 million just last year. In investment banking, private equity, if you look at the valuations, Jeff Bezos earns more in interest in about a minute than Carlos Ghosn was making in a year, if you do the math on his billions of dollars in wealth. So Ghosn was getting more and more concerned. And as we looked at the Kelly trial, it became clear that he was looking at various ways to get more money in one way or another. And a lot of the allegations that came out in the Kelly trial were about Ghosn wanting to get a refund on travel money that he had spent and going wanting to get the lion's share of incentive rewards for synergies and other areas that Nissan and Renault and Mitsubishi had put together. He also got more and more disconnected from the company. One source we talked to who was involved with Gone near the end apparently said to Gone, you're out of touch. You should have seen this coming. You should have known from somebody that there's an investigation going on under your very roof. How could three senior executives launch an internal probe and go and have no idea that this was happening? Partly was his change in lifestyle. So one of our contacts who worked with Gone early on said that he used to play bridge on Saturday night with another expat couple. And that was sort of the lifestyle he led. By 2016, he is renting out Versailles Palace for a birthday party for his second wife. That's quite a change in lifestyle, shall we say. So Ghosn changed on the one hand. Now, he contends that there was this broad conspiracy to get him. We know, yes, indeed, there was a Nissan group. Were they conspirators or were they whistleblowers? It depends on your perspective. But what about the role of governments? Gohan says that the Japanese government was involved in this conspiracy, right? And that's an easy sort of suspense novel to put together, right? That everyone's plotting to get him. We're suspicious of that for a couple of reasons. Number one, there hasn't really been hard evidence to show that there was this broad conspiracy linking Nissan, METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, the Prime Minister's office, and the Tokyo Public Prosecutors. Now, anyone who's worked in Japan probably thinks, you know, getting a conspiracy of that size for everyone to agree on it would itself be quite a battle. Secondly, if you think about how this conspiracy was supposed to work, who's going to carry the can at the end of the day? It's the prosecutors. They're the ones that get stuck with the case. And if they lose, they're the ones that are going to take the fall for it. Japan prosecutors have shown, if nothing else, that they are independent from the government. Now, that's a nice thing to say, but there is proof for that. Look at the fact that they brought down two prime ministers in their time. Kakue Tanaka, the most powerful man in Japan at the time, was taken on by the prosecutors and found guilty in a case. Former Prime Minister Takeshita in the recruit scandal. And more recently, former Justice Minister Kawai in a vote buying scandal. So the prosecutors have shown that they're independent. They're pig-headed arguably, and we'll talk about that in relation to the Greg Kelly trial. Now, we do know that Mehdi was involved in the saga. There are emails to this, and we talked to Mehdi people, and they believe their role was to stand up for Nissan against what they thought was French government pressure. The French clearly took a very activist role in the whole saga. 
Renault is a national champion for France. And so it's clear that the French government had no compulsion about trying to influence how the alliance went. And as Hans said, eventually to put the two together in at least some fashion, which would benefit Renault because Nissan is a much more successful company. But it's also worth remembering back to 1999 that at that time, Renault put up $5.4 billion and invested it in a Japanese automaker that most people thought would go bankrupt. It was an incredible gamble at the time. And so it's easy for the French government and Renault to think that it's payback time. We put up the money to rescue you. We brought in Carlos Ghosn, who added $60 billion in value. We want to get what we think we're entitled to, which is a closer alliance, if not a full merger. So there were those tensions going on, and that's one of the reasons we call the book Collision Course, because there are so many collisions going on back and forth that are around this whole saga. Now, Japan's judicial system, as Hans noted, has come under for a lot of scrutiny in this. This is probably one of the highest profile trials involving a foreigner ever in Japan. And it's gotten a lot of international scrutiny, especially in the United States, because the only defendant left is Greg Kelly, an American executive. So you hear, as Hans mentioned, hostage justice as a way to sum up Japan's justice system. Where does that phrase come from? It's blamed on the foreign media, but actually it comes from the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. It's Japan's own lawyers who have objected to the way the justice system is managed. And one of the issues seems to be that the authorities don't really mind the lawyers domestically complaining about it. But when it goes overseas and it affects Japan's international image, that's where they become very upset and have pushed back on this idea. But it is very clear from the people we talked to and the evidence in cases in the past that prosecutors do use detention as a way to get confessions. Just one example the famous Olympus fraud case, which involved over a billion dollars in corporate fraud, interestingly also brought about in the foreign news media. So the chairman, who is at the center of this billion dollar fraud, spent a few weeks in custody. An investment banker who was at the periphery of the case, but potentially involved, had pleaded not guilty, refused to plead guilty, and he spent more than three years in detention before he even came to trial. Is Japan's system that bad? Well, it's arguable because most justice systems are pretty bad. And as one expert put it, you know, Japan is being held to a theoretical standard from other countries. When you look at the Japan justice system, Kosuge, where Gon was held, is nothing like Rikers Island in New York. Right? There is no comparison to these two facilities. In actual fact, there are long periods of detention in many countries, including France. On the Greg Kelly trial itself, now, as Hans mentioned, we just had the defense closing arguments. The judges now take six months or five months till next March to come up with their verdict and their ruling. That in itself is an awfully long time. Right for Greg Kelly, who has seen three years from beginning to end on this case. Kelly is probably someone we can more easily identify with as expats here. Carlos Ghosn is a figure larger than life. Greg Kelly was a senior, but still a middle-level exec. And his case is very difficult because at the end of the day, it's pretty clear that the Japanese prosecutors never wanted to try Greg Kelly on his own. He was merely a way to get to Carlos Ghosn. At the very worst, they would have the two of them together at trial. More ideally, they would get Kelly to turn against Ghosn, get out of detention, get on a plane, and go home. He obviously refused. But the prosecutors, I don't think, because Ghosn's escape was so amazing, had never thought of the idea that they would have to try Kelly alone. And so through the trial that went on for over 60 days of hearings and witnesses, the prosecution factual support it's a bit tough to see a direct link between the wrongdoing, which was, by the way, whether Nissan had misfiled financial statements with the Financial Services Agency. That's the charge. 
And Kelly, who's not even in charge of that section, being the only person charged with guilt in that case. So the prosecutors have had a tough time. On the other hand, we've seen from Japanese judicial system that the justices here, the judges here, will tend to connect the dots more easily without actual proof than they will in other countries. And that is obviously a worry for the Kelly defense team. Because even though the prosecution can't necessarily give exact evidence and concrete evidence that Kelly was involved, he was a senior figure. He was involved in all of these and he was in charge of the CEO office. The assumption that the prosecution is asking the judges to make is that he must have known, even if there is no proof of this. And so it'll be an interesting case to see if the 2% rule applies here and Kelly gets off, or if the justices go with their 98% norm. And it's gonna be an interesting verdict because if they convict, there's gonna be a lot of outrage. A former ambassador to Japan, Mr. Haggerty, who's now a senator from Tennessee, where Nissan has its North American headquarters, has lashed out at Japan's justice system. If Kelly is found guilty, you can expect a lot more of this. At the same time, a problem is what do they do about a sentence? Now, Kikukawa, the chairman at the center of a billion dollar fraud at Olympus, was given a five year suspended sentence. What do you do to Greg Kelly? Even if found guilty is arguably sort of on the edge of the wrongdoing, right? The wrongdoing you could argue was by Carlos Ghosn and Kelly assisted him, right? Conspired with him allegedly. How much prison time, if any, can you give him in light of what Japan has done in the past? And if you give him a suspended sentence, it's going to be very easy foreign critics of the justice system to say, what was all of this about? Three years of trial and a suspended sentence and he's on his way home. So we'll know the answer to all this in March. And as Han said, there's a lot more to come. In this